Hello, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. By popular request, our trivia contests have been very popular. People have been asking us for more. So we're going to bring you another one. How good are you at aviation trivia about X-Planes? Now, I want to mention something here. Yes, it's a contest, but if you don't know much about these airplanes, uh, please do enjoy the presentation. Uh, it's not about winning or getting every question right. We have a lot of information, a lot of good stories, and we just hope you'll enjoy uh, taking the test and learning about these incredible historic airplanes. Now, if you haven't played before, here's how it works. We give you a statement like this one. A lifting body is when your friends hold you up off the ground. Yeah. Well, you have to tell us if that's true or false. So the, oh no, really? Ugh. That's not a lifting body. It's false. That's a lifting body. All right. I think you get the idea. You ready? Let's play. To maximize security for Bell's XP-59 era comet, America's first jet, in flight, the pilots wore bowler hats and gorilla masks while smoking cigars in the cockpit. Really? I've been asked to uh, wait a second before I give you the answer. But it's true. The Bell XP-59 was America's first jet flown in October of 1942. You've probably seen photos of the fake balsa wood propeller uh, stuck on the nose of the airplane. Of course, the jet engines were covered. And this was a top secret uh, program at the beginning of World War II, a tremendous need for secrecy. Well, the problem was that the airplane operated out of uh, Muroc North Base at the north end of Rogers Dry Lake, and the Air Force operations were at the south end. So in flight, this airplane would be jumped by P-38s or P-51s from South Base. And the pilots would be seeing this uh, propellerless craft, usually trailing uh, some smoke behind it, flown by a gorilla smoking a cigar wearing a bowler hat. Well, what P-38 pilot in his right mind would uh, walk into the flight surgeon's office the next morning and report exactly what he saw? Yeah, you guessed it, none. So the reported sightings in flight of the XP-59 over Muroc, zero. Captain Chuck Yeager made more flights in rocket-powered airplanes than any other test pilot at Edwards. Now think about that. But the answer is false. Yeager had 34 flights in the Bell X-1, four flights in the X-1A for a total of 38 rocket-powered flights total. The winner is this gentleman, Albert Scott Crossfield. Crossfield had 10 flights in the X-1, 89 flights in the Douglas Sky Rocket, and 14 flights in the North American X-15, a total of 113 rocket plane flights. Muroc Test Center was used to train U.S. Army Air Force's bomber pilots for the Pacific Air War in 1942 and featured a fake wood battleship on the lake bed for accurate target practice? And that answer is true. And there it is. The ship was nicknamed the Muroc Maru. Here's a close-up of the structure, and it proved to be very effective in giving uh, pilots a full-size uh, training aid on the lake bed there to perfect their techniques. In my painting of Chuck Yeager's first supersonic flight in the Bell X-1 on October 14, 1947, the Lockheed P-80 chase plane is flying in the X-1 shadow to keep the sun out of the pilot's eyes. And that pilot was none other than First Lieutenant Bob Hoover. There's the painting. You can see the shadow on the jet. And that answer is true. Here's uh, the famed back of the napkin sketch for that painting. And Chuck was very emphatic about uh, the RF-80 shooting star uh, flying in his eight o'clock position at this point in the approach. Well, when Bob Hoover saw the painting, he said to me, Mike, that's exactly correct. How did you know that? I flew in Chuck's shadow to keep the sun out of my eyes. And then after a pause, he added, and I've been flying in Chuck's shadow ever since. 
The Bell X-2 was the first manned aircraft to fly at hypersonic speed in 1956. Hypersonic is defined as Mach 5 and above. That's false because this pilot, Captain Mel Apt, flew the X-2 on 27 September 1956. Here's a picture of that flight launching at 33,000 feet above Rosamond, California. And Apt flew into the morning sun and did something that nobody ever expected. It was his first flight in the X-2, his first flight in a rocket-powered airplane, and he achieved a perfect flight profile, which gave him 15 seconds more rocket burn, and he achieved a speed of Mach 3.2 at 70,000 feet. The airplane was stable for 26 seconds, but as uh, Apt turned back toward the lake bed, it departed controlled flight and tumbled in inertia coupling. Uh, sadly, Mel App did not survive uh, and impacted the desert floor. The Douglas D558-2 Skyrocket flew in three different configurations, a pure jet, a jet-rocket hybrid, and an air-launched rocket. That's true. Here we see an early flight with the short tail. Uh, initial flights were flown by Douglas test pilot Johnny Martin. And this is the all-jet airplane. They added Jato bottles for better performance and uh, raised the height of the vertical fin as well. Then they added rocket uh, barrels, same engine as the X-1, the XLR-11. And then the uh, pure rocket was uh, air-launched from a Navy uh, B-29. The X-3 Stiletto was the first aircraft to use titanium structure and have an air-conditioned cockpit. And that is true. Here we see the X-3 on the lake bed, and you look at the uh, bare metal section there at the engine exhaust, that's titanium structure. First time ever, it was used in an airplane. And here's the uh, close-up of the cockpit, and you notice it doesn't have a canopy that raises up or down. The entry to the airplane was uh, in an elevator system where the pilot sat in the ejection seat and was raised up into the cockpit, but it was air-conditioned. The Bell X-5 was the first variable geometry or swing wing aircraft to fly, but its wing sweep could only be changed manually on the ground. And that is false. The Bell X-5 was based on this airplane, the German Messerschmitt P-1101, an advanced concept captured by the Allies at the end of World War II, and Bell Aircraft Company modified it into this airplane. But it was the it was the Messerschmitt that uh, required the wings to be swept manually on the ground and not in flight. The X-5 used a pivot system that later uh, wound up in airplanes like the F-111 or the F-14. And here we see a multiple exposure photo showing the different positions of the swept wing. To demonstrate jet vertical takeoff and landing operations, the Ryan X-13 VertiJet was trucked to Washington, D.C. to make a demo flight in the Pentagon's parking lot. And that is true. The X-13 first flew in 1957. Here we see it operating at Edwards South Base. It was a very successful airplane. It uh, took off and landed uh, from a Fruhoff trailer truck that you see there, and it uh, transitioned into horizontal flight and reached speeds in excess of 500 miles an hour. Here it is on the trailer, and this was indeed driven to Washington, D.C., and the airplane performed a demonstration in the uh, Pentagon parking lot there on the edge of the Potomac River. I had a very uh, dear friend who grew up as a kid in Baltimore, Maryland, and he said his dad took him down to the Pentagon to see this, and he described it as the loudest thing he had ever heard in his life. The first pilot to fly the X-15 with its unique cue ball nose, was Neil Armstrong. And that is true. Now here's the X-15 in its initial configuration with a yaps boom or a data boom fixed to the nose. The cue ball was an advanced system that gave uh, the pilot attitude indication at very high speeds. And the first pilot to fly it was Neil Armstrong. As Milt Thompson liked to say in his book, after the X-15, X-15, Neil went on to other things in the space program. Right. 
During their test programs at Edwards, lifting bodies only landed on Rogers Dry Lake. That's false. While they did land on the lake bed many times, uh, lifting bodies had a very steep descent. Uh, approaches were flown around 300 miles per hour. But this is the Martin X-24B, which is on final, turning from base to final to land right about there on Lake Bed 1A. They dropped out of the sky like a brick. However, in 1975, NASA pilot John Mankey flew the X-24B to a pinpoint precision landing on uh, Edwards Concrete Runway 04, actually hitting a white line painted on the uh, runway not once, but twice proving that a lifting body and eventually the space shuttle could make precision landings on a concrete runway. Scott Crossfield flew without gloves to get a better control feel of the airplane when he made the first Mach 2 flight in the Douglas Skyrocket. That is true. On 20 November 1953, Scotty flew this airplane to a speed of Mach 2.005, and indeed was barehanded. He mentioned to me that he wanted to get the uh, absolute sensitivity of the airplane, and at altitude, his hand actually froze to the stick. Joe Engel was the youngest person to fly the X-15 and the youngest person to qualify for astronaut wings in that airplane. And that is true. On 29 June, 1965, Engel flew this airplane, X-15 Ship 3, to an altitude of 280,600 feet. The definition of space is 260,000 feet. So on his landing, which he entitled in this in my painting, uh, First Re-Entry, uh, he was indeed the youngest person to achieve that. The title was First Re-Entry because this is his first time returning from space. The second time was in 1981, piloting the space shuttle Columbia. Here's a picture of Joe on the lake bed. Wonderful guy. North American's triple sonic XB-70 Valkyrie flew faster than the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. This is a tricky question, but it's false. The XB-70, built by North American and flown in the mid-1960s, was the largest airplane ever to fly three times the speed of sound. Max was Mach 3.06 at 70,000 feet for 30 minutes, its design goal. The Lockheed Blackbird, SR-71, flew at Mach 3.3 at 90,000 feet for as much as up to 90 minutes at a time. Monsanto's MA-25 heat ablative coating for the X-15A2 was hot pink in color. That's true. Now, I know you've seen the airplane looking like this. It's got the large external tanks and a white uh, uh, paint job, but that was actually a protective coating for the ablative material, which was indeed hot pink. And the famous story is that X-15 pilot Pete Knight, who flew this airplane to Mach 6.7 in October of 1967, first saw this rolling out of the hangar and said, quote, there's no way I'm going to be flying a blankety-blank hot pink airplane painted white. Pete loved telling that story. After launching X-15s and lifting bodies, the NB-52 mothership took nearly an hour to fly back to Edwards Air Force Base. That's true. An average X-15 speed flight was six to eight minutes, and an average altitude flight was eight to ten minutes. Occasionally, there'd be in-flight aborts like you see here, and the X-15 would have to return to Edwards under the wing of the 52 in a captive flight, and that took nearly an hour. But it was tradition that uh, once the X-15s had landed, the B-52, once it returned, would fly what they called the mothership salute, which is a low altitude, high speed pass over the X-15 or lifting body seen here. Pretty dramatic. During a test at Edwards, the space shuttle was once launched from a NASA 747 mothership to prove it could land after returning from orbit. It's a bit of a trick question because the answer is false. 
yes, the shuttle Enterprise was launched off the back of the NASA 747 shuttle carrier aircraft, but it launched five times, not once. Initial landing was with the uh, streamlined uh, tail cone that you see here. It was a fairing to cover the rocket exhausts and streamline the exhaust, uh, uh, streamline the airflow over the 747's vertical stabilizer. On the fourth flight seen here, there was a tremendous amount of turbulence generated from those rocket bells, and there was actual concern that it might possibly uh, rip the fin off the 747, which thankfully didn't happen. But that's the reason for those outrigger fins that you see on the horizontal stabilizers. That was to uh, allow the 747 to reach the lake bed in an emergency landing if it was required. Here's my painting of Free Enterprise, the fourth uh, free flight, and you see the lake bed down below. And I should mention that uh, these uh, launches were made from approximately 25,000 feet. And with the uh, tail cone on the shuttle, the flight time was just over five minutes to the lake bed. And as seen here, without that streamlined fairing, the shuttle flight time was cut to less than half that, two minutes and 15 seconds. And this is a shot of uh, Joe Engel flying the Enterprise on free flight four. And here he is with his co-pilot, Dick Truly. And uh, Joe was a bit of a prankster. So when they uh, exited the shuttle on this flight, they were both wearing helmet and goggles because they were test pilots. Gotta love it. Captain Ivan Kinchlow was named first of the spacemen when he flew the Bell X-2 to 126,000 feet in September of 1956. And that is true. Here's a painting of the X-2. Uh, it was the first flight outside of the Earth's measurable atmosphere. It was a ballistic flight, which required tremendous pilot uh, skill. And of course, that was uh, Ivan Kinchlow, Kinch for short. Uh, Ivan Kinchlow was scheduled to be the chief X-15 Air Force project pilot. Tragically, he was lost in an F-104 accident in 1958, one year before the X-15 flew. Converse's first Delta Wing aircraft was the F-102 Delta Dagger. That is false. It was an X-plane, the XF-92A. XF-92A was flown by Air Force pilots like Chuck Yeager, seen here, and NACA pilots like Scott Crossfield. This led the way to a family of Delta Wing airplanes built by Convair, beginning with the F-102, the F-106 Delta Dart, the XFY-1 Pogo, XF-2Y Sea Dart, and of course the magnificent B-58 Hustler. Wait a minute, I have a better photo of the Hustler. Yeah, how about that? You didn't think I was going to make a video without a model box stop. There it is. Well, just in case we need a tiebreaker, here it is. And this is fun. Ready? Edwards Main Runway 0422 is shown on charts as measuring 15,000 feet long by 300 feet wide, but it actually measures 300 feet wide by 14,999 feet long. That's true. Here's a picture of that hallowed piece of real estate seen from a T-38 taking off. And here's the runway actually being poured in uh, the construction of main base, which was in uh, summer and fall of 1955. But what happened to that missing piece of concrete that measured one foot by 999 feet? Well, that concrete wound up as the swimming pool in the base commander's house in Area P housing, a fabled piece of Edwards lore. So how did you do? I hope you enjoyed the uh, trivia quiz on X-Planes. And thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. Always enjoy uh, having you on board these uh, presentations. If you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you be a subscriber. And please do hit the like button on your way out because that does help us in the ratings with YouTube. As always, until next time, take care. <laughs>